Hello and welcome to another TLDR UK video. And the topic of today's video is something everyone enjoys, House of Commons reports. Okay, well, maybe not everyone, but certainly us. And even better, as the one we're discussing today is only 50 pages long, so we don't have to spend the whole day wading through a massive report. So in this video, let's see if this smoking gun was loaded, or if it's just firing blanks. Let's explore the Russia report and its implications for the UK, elections and Brexit. Before we get into it, I'd like to quickly shine some light onto our new project, The Daily Briefing. Every day at 5pm, we're sharing a summary of the day's news, letting you catch up in three minutes or less. The briefing is available to read in newsletter form, as well as as a podcast. But if you want to make things even easier, you can sign up for the newsletter by using the link in the description, which means you'll be sent it straight to your inbox every day. Also, everyone who signs up gets a free TLDR prize, so double reasons for doing so. Thanks so much for your support. The report has been a long time in the making, or to be precise, it's taken a long time to be published. Having supposedly been ready for publication for over a year and a half, the Intelligence and Security Committee finally published the report on the role of Russia on Tuesday morning, despite many insisting that it should be published before the 2019 election. Anyway, the government finally allowed the report to be published, and here it is. While not as juicy as many might have hoped, with particularly sensitive details redacted to ensure that Russia wouldn't be able to use it to undermine security, the report nonetheless does touch on some key areas, starting off with the claim that Russia does indeed want to target us, and target us hard. Russia seems to see foreign policy as a zero-sum game. Any actions it can take which damage the West are fundamentally good for Russia, with them specifically targeting the UK given just how close their relationship with the United States is, and the fact that the UK is seen as central to the Western anti-Russian lobby. The report makes clear that Russia is a capable state, who regularly uses cyber attacks on foreign nations. Most interestingly, the report confirms what many already knew, that Russia does indeed use cyber attacks to meddle in democratic elections. While the report claims that the UK government is becoming more assertive when handling Russia, it also argues that in the past, the government was too reticent about causing a diplomatic incident to actually name and shame Russia. The example they give is from 2010, when the Security and Intelligence Committee was asked to remove a mention of Russia as the nation behind a set of cyber security attacks, out of fear that this would worsen diplomatic relations between the countries. While the report does praise the assertive approach that the government is now taking, it continues to criticise the poor lines of accountability in relation to the response to Russia. The report provides two general examples of this. Firstly, while the Foreign Secretary is responsible for the National Cyber Security Centre, it's the Home Secretary that's responsible for major crime incidents. The report even goes on to claim that other ministers are also involved in the response, further muddying the water as to who's actually accountable for the UK's response to cybercrime. The second is in relation to the cooperation between departments. In 2014, the National Offensive Cyber Programme was created, which was a partnership between the Ministry of Defence and GCHQ. This sounds good, doesn't it? Well, it might be, but the issue is that again, it diminishes accountability, because it begs the question, which organisation is truly responsible for cybercrime? And then again, in its own section entitled Allocation of Effort, the report highlights a relatively disjointed view on intelligence in the UK, at one point questioning if the government took its eye off the ball post-Cold War. Turning its attention to Russian disinformation and influence, the report draws upon four broad examples of how Russia spreads disinformation, defining them by the promotion of intentionally false, distorting or distracting narratives, as well as accusing them of launching so-called influence campaigns, ranging from the use of state-owned traditional media, notably Russia Today, as well as the use of bots and trolls, so-called hack-and-leak campaigns, such as the instances in the 2016 US and 2017 French election campaigns, as well as real-life political interference. The report states that it's been widely reported that Kremlin-linked entities have made soft loans to the then National Front in France, seemingly at least in part as a reward for the party having supported Russia's annexation of Crimea. 
with the report also highlighting some of the key aims of said campaigns, including eliciting direct support of a pro-Russian narrative and casting doubt on true accounts of events, with the report saying, when people start to say, you don't know what to believe, or they're all as bad as each other, the disinformers are winning allowing the Russians to engender a preferred outcome in overseas political issues and elections, or a general poisoning of the political narrative in the West by fermenting political extremism and wedge issues. Although, despite misinformation and wedge issues being used by Russia, the report does make clear that the UK electoral system is somewhat secure. Unlike other countries, the UK continues to use a paper-based system, where you go out and vote, you get given a ballot sheet and a ridiculously small pencil to mark an X in the box of your preferred candidate, which means that directly interfering with the highly dispersed paper-based voting system would be difficult to say the least, something covered by fellow YouTuber Tom Scott twice now. However, just because Russia can't interfere directly with the results of the election, they can fuel political narratives and conversation, allowing them to change people's minds as well as spreading disinformation and poisoning political narratives. Which leads us to the bit that you've all been waiting for. Did Russia interfere with the Brexit referendum? Well, in a largely redacted section, the report is very quick to disappoint. There have been widespread public allegations that Russia sought to influence the 2016 referendum on the UK's membership of the EU. The impact of such attempts would be difficult, if not impossible, to assess, and we have not attempted to do so. <sighs> Whether or not the committee would have been able to do so is another matter, though. As the report states that in response to our request for written evidence at the outset of the inquiry, MI5 initially provided just six lines of text. So, while the report doesn't even try and reach a conclusion on Brexit, it does highlight that if there were interference in the EU referendum, it wouldn't be the first time. There has been credible open source commentary suggesting that Russia undertook influence campaigns in relation to the Scottish independence referendum in 2014, something that was, according to the report, not taken seriously enough until after Russia's hack and leak operation against the Democratic National Committee in the US, when stolen emails were leaked. All in all, the committee has called upon the UK intelligence community to produce an assessment of Russian interference specifically in the EU referendum, and publish an unclassified summary. So, it looks like it could be some time before we get any more conclusive information. Especially, as in the government's response to the report, they state, We have seen no evidence of successful interference in the EU referendum. The intelligence and security agencies produce and contribute to regular assessments. When new information emerges, the government will always consider the most appropriate use of any intelligence. Given this long-standing approach, a retroactive assessment of the EU referendum is not necessary. So, it seems that the government is unable or unwilling to conduct a full analysis of the Brexit referendum and alleged Russian interference, despite pervasive evidence of Russian interference and misinformation campaigns being undertaken at the same time as the referendum. If you want us to explore this issue further in a future video, then you can let us know by liking this video and commenting down below. Also, while you're in the comments, let us know if you think it's fair to let Brexit lie, or if you think it's suspicious that those in government, most of whom are on the Brexit side, aren't willing to investigate the validity of their own victory. On a different note, the role of Russian expats in the UK is something that the report discusses in some length. Drawing attention to the extensive business and political links between UK businesses and government to Russian expats, and by extension, the Kremlin. Specifically, when it comes to what's been dubbed the London laundromat. For Russian oligarchs and their money, London appeared to be the truly prime target, with light-touch regulation, strong capital and housing markets, and the dependability of the UK's judicial system. The report is clear that the UK welcomed Russian money, and few questions, if any, were asked about the providence of this considerable wealth. And that, in brief, Russian influence in the UK is the new normal, particularly in London grad, with this level of integration meaning that any measures now being taken by the government are not preventative, but rather constitute damage limitation. Adding further fuel to the fire, 
The report specifically mentions that several members of the Russian elite who are closely linked to Putin are identified as being with charitable and or political organisations in the UK. Having donated to political parties grants them a public profile, which positions them to assist Russian influence operations. It's also notable that a number of the members of the House of Lords have business interests linked to Russia or work directly for major Russian companies linked to the Russian state. It's notably this clause, focusing on Russian donations to British political parties, that many view as the main driver behind the delay of the report's publication with the BBC reporting that Dominic Cummings, Johnson's chief advisor, did not allow the publication of the report before the November election, possibly fearing that doing so would impact Tory donors. The report makes clear that there are a number of reasons why Russia is so difficult to deal with. Seemingly, one of the main reasons is the speed at which Russia makes decisions. Putin has a small inner team and therefore can make decisions very quickly which often takes the West by surprise. An example given is the annexation of Crimea. Due to the parliamentary democracy that operates in the UK, matching this speed is not easy and maybe not even possible or desirable. The report points out that this isn't an issue the UK has been slow to react to. Rather, Russia is targeting a vast number of nations, especially allied ones to Europe and NATO, Yet, while there appears to be increasing signs that others in Europe are taking the threat from Russia more seriously, there has been less success in translating this into building public support for the UK's diplomatic approach to the attribution and condemnation of Russia's cyber activities. In the final section, the report, without mincing its words, states that Russia is simply paying lip service to the notion of better relations. The Russian government is looking for engagement on its terms alone, paying lip service to the notions of better relations with the UK and seeking more economic cooperation while flouting UK sovereignty and in the Skripal attack, the most essential of international principles around prohibition of chemical weapons. So that's it. The Russia report, while not the smoking gun many were hoping for, does raise some interesting questions. The principal one being, is this just the start of many, many things to come? What do you think? Is a further investigation needed? Does someone need to latch onto the hot potato and allow it to cool down? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, you can also get involved in the conversation over on Discord. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Daily Briefing newsletter. The link to that is in the description. Finally, a special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.